Now, on Monday, we showed you the first part of our hotline documentary, As If We Weren't Human. Now, that's a catalogue of brutalities that have been meted out to citizens by the security forces. So, let's bring you excerpts of the documentary and then when we come back, we'll hear from human rights activist Francis Xavier Susu. Uh, we'll also speak to Justice Emil Short, who is a former commissioner of Shraj, and I'm sure they'll have quite a bit to share on this. On 7th February 2018, residents of Fuase in the Akrima Kwaoma district of the Ashanti region protested the relocation of district capital Fuase to Kredie. The police and military teams were sent to maintain peace, but it turned tragic as four people were killed and many injured. Stephen Insian narrates that on that day, he went to run an errand for his church when he was shot. So when I was going, I, there was a crowd making something like they were making noise. And when I got there, I stood and I stood there and called my friend and he said he's around that area. And I said, okay, I'm also here. So you should come and let us settle everything that. You should come and let us settle what he told me. And the police guys came and the 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 moment they they I mean they landed they just sh they shoot him. So I was panicked. I couldn't uh, go back and I couldn't go for it. So I decided to find a place to hide. What I just um seeing is I was at the hospital and was paralyzed and I couldn't do anything. So that is what uh, that is what I all about what I can say. Bedridden. He has lost the desire of living again. He wants to die. Because aside the pain the persons were killed by the joint police and military team. Douglas Adai, Kojo Ofori, Prince Apia Boating, and Kweku Seth. Their <laughs> families are buried in deep sorrow and have vowed never to bury them until they find out the truth behind these killings. So well. I will balance him. I will not cast any anyone. You see him. Now, I will not. I will catch him. I will not see him. See him to me. See him. If he say, I am not no. Huh? And then Branso, I will go. And he say, Obi say what dia? I say, Oni no. I cast a. I am not who say. What say what dia? Answer. I am fit to be a copper. Well, and uh, that is, uh, those are excerpts from As If We Weren't Human. 
which we will be airing in full uh, due to Kobina's uh, rather in-depth look at police and uh, br uh, security services brutality. Uh, I, I wish it didn't happen so often, but it does. But we're very honored to have with us a uh, human rights a activist and lawyer, Francis Xavier Susu. Uh, do I say your middle name right, Francis? Yes? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. good, good, good. I've been practicing in front of the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Francis Xavier Susu, of course, uh, has been a lawyer now for almost a decade, and uh, he concerns himself primarily with the uh, human rights cases, uh, represents people in the uh, um, uh, Justice for All program, mm -hmm. among other things. Uh, Francis, it's, it's an honor to have you. It's good to see yeah. you as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's also good to see it's, you. Yeah. It's, Representing it's the mob rower. we the mob rower. <laughs> 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 I don't even know what that means. <laughs> you, when were you mob rower? <laughs> Qualify for lip. Easy. Mm. <laughs> it means test. Just yeah. Test. yeah. But um, uh, Francis, I mean, watching, watching excerpts of... Um, you know the, the effect that brutality has on its victims. You know, watching uh, excerpts like this, I wonder uh, whether it takes you back to perhaps what motivated you to even concern yourself with you know the human rights aspect of the law in the first place. Uh, um, absolutely. In fact, it, it does. It does because I remember, um, you know, growing up at the backyards of uh, uh, Newtown and seeing those days. We were kids, but we used to experience a lot of, you know, what we describe as scatter. And anytime you say scatter, it means that this military police are in town and they are shooting. And there are several times that you would see bullet pallets all over the place uh, because they are, you know, in operation to, you know, arrest this supposed uh, suspected drug dealers and so on and so forth and many many years down the line maybe like 20 years down the line it looks like the practice has not changed <laughs> I mean uh, police is always putting their professionality in question anytime they are faced with situations where they have to demonstrate high level professionality and it's quite unfortunate mm. but why is it even still uh, a, 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 you know, a source of confusion. Why are we even in doubt that police brutality is wrong? Why do some policemen still feel that it is within their rights to assault defenseless members of the public? You know, I have been one of the advocates for a review of the curriculum. For, uh, for police? For police. Training? Yeah, police training. Okay. Yes. Uh, because I have the impression that a lot of these young men who pass out of, you know, uh, who pass out to become police officers do not have adequate training in human rights and the need to respect human life. Obviously, the major function of policing is protection of life and property. Mm -hmm. But I, I dare say that there is little value for life and property, particularly when it is critical. And I'm talking like critical means that it's not a normal situation. You see, you have to lift up your game when, you know, in times of riot and in times of you know, abnormal situation. That's where you need to exhibit the highest degree yeah. of professionality. It's not when it's, uh, everything is normal and you're standing by the roadside and mm. parking, you know, cars and trying to <laughs> extort some money. No, 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 that's not, that's not the kind of policy we're talking about. When, you know, uh, it becomes so critical, riots, things are happening and you need to demonstrate high level of professionality and giving, you know, you know mind to... You know, valuing life beyond the weapon. Mm. But unfortunately, I think police consistently has failed. Failed, 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 failed. You know, look at what happened even in Adenta recently. Mm. They claim, well, we didn't be anybody, but the clips are all over the place. Showing that they You know, did. yeah, they did. You know, they meted us some, uh, meted us some brutality. You know, we saw what happened when Occupy Ghana went on them. Look, people were beaten. And I'm like, wow. 
Hmm. Look at recently what happened, some journalists beating at the police headquarters. Sometimes it's just so unbelievable, you know. And I think that there is something wrong with training, training, training. But, but how pervasive is it then, um, the, the, the issues of police human rights abuses? Mm -hmm. uh, because you have interacted with no, people. I think it, it's very, very pervasive. Look, in my office, you know, we've been doing various kinds of advocacy. For example, we have the youth... And if it's of your office, you mean your law firm? Law firm, and then the offices of the Youth for Human Rights, uh, 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 Youth for Human Rights Africa. We receive lots, lots of them, lots of complaints. Our police brutality, in fact, we've sent a number of petitions to peeps, police, you know, all kinds of things happening all over the place. And it's very, very pervasive. Hmm. And I think police need to, you know, sit up. I mean, our institution, they, they need to sit up. And I think they need to reconsider. I have said that, look, every police officer must pass a course in human rights before you are, you know, put out there mm. to go and police. Because you, it, it's so fundamental. How easy is it to win a case of police brutality against, you know... Uh, <laughs> well, uh, hmm. I, I, I would say that it, it's all dependent. There are times that when you do a petition to peace, peace majors, uh, there is some form of settlement. You know, basically when people are violated, what they want is remedy. Mm -hmm. Like these people that were killed, you know, innocent people killed. Seven I don't think that them. seven of them. The police institution, the police council, government, Ministry of Defense, Interior. You see, you don't need to wait for us to even want to go to court. This is a fine case where there is even a committee, an interministerial committee or something, that will sit down and take complaints, listen to you know, um, the stories of these people and come up with a recommendation for their compensation. So that we don't even need to go to human rights court to now be advocating and asking. Because you know that what you did is wrong. Yeah. But hmm. at the end of the day, we have to come to a certain conclusion as a people. Um, if the advocacy or the commentary is about how we need to change police training, mm. that at what point do we have to realign what the social cultural reflection of the society is mm. on the people we recruit as police mm. and then those who tend to administer or train them? Mm. Because uh, they say we are the, the leaders we have mm. are a reflection of our society. Absolutely. So the police people us, we yeah. have Absolutely. are a reflection of who that, we that, are. That is true. Mm. Yeah. That is true. I think that I think that is what uh, the role of in-service training and retrainings, you know, are supposed to do. Yes, that is who we are. We are brutish. We are. We are. We are. We, you know, we, we are. We are. Is it bloodthirsty? We we are wicked. You know, as a people, I you see that we are very very wicked. But you know what? That is why we are regulated by laws. The police, as an institution would have to enforce their internal laws without fear or favor. Mm. Whilst training new recruits in these values. And I'm sure that if we can do this consistently, we should be able to you know, improve, at least lift up the image of policing in this country. And I'm looking forward, in fact, I'm hopeful that soon and very soon, we would see a new police service. You know, there will be a new face, a, a, a new, uh, uh, um, um, you know, approach to policing in this country, and I really look forward to that, honestly. Indeed. Now, um, obviously, uh, the, this this documentary doesn't only focus on the police. The military are also uh, mm -hmm. brought in for their bit of. Um, you know, debate. And uh, there is that horrifying story of two soldiers who brutalized that young boy yeah. in the north um, and, uh, you know, melted a plastic bottles onto his back and all of that. And that's the military. Now, I, I won't pretend mm. that I don't see the logic behind the military and its reputation of being fearful. Mm. There is a need for the people to fear the military. Mm. When there's trouble and you know the military is a last resort, 
you know, people have to react accordingly when the military is brought in. Mm. Is it going to be as easy, you know, rehabilitating the military for them to not brutalize civilians as it will be for the police? Because the military are trained to do that, aren't they? Yeah, you know, so, we, yeah, military are trained to do that. Mm. But not against innocent civilians. Mm. You see, that is where they get it wrong. I mean, if we are in their armored cars and dress and you know yes they are fearful but they are not supposed to terrorize innocent civilians around and this guy i happen to be the lawyer for this young boy mm. when this case came out initially and we've been following this case following this case following this case and um you know uh, you would see clearly that even from the internal structures not much has been done about this matter, hmm. if I tell it. So my, my, my point is that yes, that is the nature of your training. But that does not extend to using, you know, the opportunities that you have, your training, to interfere, to bully innocent citizens and violate them. Because they are also human beings. Hmm. If I, your training is to protect them. So once you go outside your way, see that's what we call it military discipline. Yeah. It is a discipline. What you have done is actually going outside the dictates, you see, of the rules of laws that govern that, you know, uh, discipline. Mm -hmm. And so when it happens, I think that the leaders, you know, the CDS, the chief of staff, and all the people who are concerned, they would have to crack the whip. That is the only way you can sanitize the system. Mm -hmm. You know, because by all means, if you be a men's home, <laughs> there are a lot of men's sense. Unfortunately, in Ghana, it's only in Ghana that I've seen that Messes are just too many. Yeah. <laughs> the messes there are, are more than one in the you know, family. Yeah, yeah, they are just too <laughs> many. ideally, you're just supposed mm. to have one. At least one mess. But in Ghana, just too many messes all over the place and in the institutions. Mm. You know, and, and the sad part of it is, I see, in a country like ours, the military cannot stand alone. Police cannot stand alone. We have institutions like the judiciary, the court, that are supposed to hold the balance even. We have institutions like Shraj, because when there is a violation, either by the police or the military, you can go to court, but you can also go to Shraj. How effective are these institutions in the performance of their constitutional mandate? In giving remedy. In giving remedy. Mm. Because, you see, if Shraj is very, very active in giving remedies, you know, to people who are violated, mm -hmm. and and you know it is frequent, and they are publishing their 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 whatever their, uh, the, their the remedies that they give to people who are violated. That in itself could have served as a deterrent mm. to the services, but that also is zero. Mm. So it looks like as a nation we have a lot a long way to go in this. A, respect. a lot of the solution is pointing towards retraining, reorienting. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, is, is that it? Is it a one-prong uh, approach here? Uh, are there other factors that uh, you know perhaps we ought to be looking at? Um, for example, uh, this whole idea of the police and the military living in barracks away from. Uh, you know, uh, the general public. Is it, is it time for us to look at that again or, well, or not? I, no, no. You see, I, I think that that may not generally be a solution because, I mean, uh, just by observation and across board, look at other countries and what happens. The police, they live as, you know, citizens. They live among the people and, and that does not, you know, bring about any uh, kinds of uh, violation. I think that the violations are due to impunity and people just want to break the law. I mean, let's be frank to the services, and let's be fair to the services. Mm. It's not everybody in the police service that go about doing, blessing all over doing the place. What, what yeah. We're seeing. <laughs> yeah, doing the things that we're seeing. Mm. There have been police officers who have distinguished themselves in the performance of their duties. Military men who have distinguished themselves. They've been military men for several years. They have no issue. All they have is just doing their work in, you know, in, in, in service of their nation. But you have a few, that's why I say, well, not few, but a lot of men sense around. What we need to do is to weed out all this men sense by the use of the internal laws, and then once we train the new recruits, not to repeat what 
mm. you know, those people are doing. And we should be able to get some. And then get the court and then shrug another, you know, uh, constitutional bodies mm. to give remedies when necessary. Mm. Uh, elsewhere, you, you tend to read stories about, and you are even a testimony of getting some kind of repudiation or some rem mm. remediation for those who have been wronged in a way. Mm. Uh, but it looks like um, the, the society we have, it's not uh, the same reflection of other societies in which uh, we have police brutalities to the numbers mm. being commensurate to um, what the structure of the population is, mm. for example. Mm. Uh, you, if you have a population that may be coming from war, okay. then you get to have certain characteristics permeating. Mm -hmm. or you take America, there's, 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 there's constant concern about police br brutalities because of race, etc. Mm -hmm. So, but we don't tend to find that in our population. Mm -hmm. But we tend to have these incremental numbers of mm -hmm. incidents, mm -hmm. of police wronging mm -hmm. their citizens. Yes, Why? You know, I think it, it is basically training. You know, I have this impression that the police are not human rights compliant. In any time, talk about human rights. Oh, for human rights, you know, like when the police, are, you know, when the police arrest you, and you are asking for your rights, you know, the police. This is the, you, are, you. You don't have to talk right here, you know. Yes. You see, so it, 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 I have the impression that look, these guys need training. They just need, you see, because when you understand the rights of a citizen. Because as a police officer who has to defend and protect the life of a person, if you understand the body of rights that a person is entitled to at the point of arrest, mm -hmm. even if you think that the person is wrong, you know, some policemen believe that, look, you can use all kinds of unconventional, even it can be an unlawful means of, you know, uh, destroying uh, maybe unlawful assembly. Mm -hmm. The assembly may be unlawful, mm -hmm. but you need to use lawful means because that's why you have been trained. Yeah. You see, so it's not the fact that, oh, the guy messed up, so you just have to also mess him up. You know, that's why you've been trained. So I think that we have a big problem with training of our police officers. They need a lot of training and retraining, particularly in human rights and consideration for human life. And the police will have to also consider the setting up. Either it's going to be a commission or something that will be in charge of this funding, uh, uh, this uh, compensation thing. Yeah. And we must also begin a system where people who are culpable mm -hmm. will be held responsible in terms of in, in monetary compensation. Mm. As in, yes, so as, if, as in personnel. Oh yeah, in yeah, personnel. I mean, if you are an investigator in a matter, that turns out to be a, a, a malicious prosecution, and the state is sued. Mm. It's not enough for the state to say that okay, you did wrong, so go home. I mean, when the state is supposed to pay compensation. You know, your salaries, your benefits could be seized to pay for those compensations. Mm. So when you know that, look, I am, I, I, maybe I'm a, I'm, a command, I'm a regional commander, my instructions can lead me to me paying personally, being held responsible, and mm. even some of my earnings and entitlements could be used to pay some of these things. You'll be careful the next time. Some level of to, collective yeah. responsibility. Collective responsibility. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, we're, we're joined on the phone by Justice Emil Short, who, of course, uh, after many years at the, at the, um, at the bench, mm. uh, was also um, uh, a former commissioner of the Commission of Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shraj. Uh, Justice Short, good morning. Thank you so much for your time with us. Mm. Good morning to you and good morning to your listeners. It's a pleasure. Indeed. Now, that, uh, just a short, this, uh, this concept of uh, you know, the police brutality in particular, uh, you know, leaving out the other security uh, forces for a moment, but the uh, police brutality in particular, unfortunately, has started to become institutionalized. But for many years, it seems that we all accepted it, including perhaps those who were at the bench, the judges, because uh, in other parts of the world, if a person is brutalized by a police officer or they are in any way um, abused while under arrest, their entire case can get thrown out on the basis of that. But here in Ghana, it would appear that judges, uh, they, they, they don't really make much of a deal of uh, the, the state in which 
uh, you know, suspects are brought into court, uh, do they? Um, I don't think that I can subscribe to that criticism of the judges. What I can speak about is the extent of police brutality that we have witnessed in recent times. And I think that um, it is most unfortunate, and that is putting it mildly. Uh, it appears to me that the police have not been trained properly to be able to exercise right judgment when it comes to dealing with protesters, for example. And in recent times, we have seen so many instances of extreme police brutality and the use of excessive force in situations which such force was totally unnecessary. In the first place, I don't even understand why police have to use live bullets when they are confronted with unarmed civilians. In other jurisdictions, there is always the use of, you know, other methods like tear gas, water cannons, rubber bullets, and in many of the situations which we see on TV, on CNN and, and BBC, you see that police, when they are confronted with protesters who have been exhibiting violence, have shields to protect them against some of the uh, throwing of stones and so on. But we have not adopted such methods which exercise restraint. The police have not been trained to exercise restraint and circumspection. And that is most unfortunate. The victims, the majority of such victims, are left without any remedy, either because they can't go to court because of lack of financial resources, or if they are able to go to court, the court process takes so long. And um, and so and that, that is the problem that we are confronted with. That is why recently, as a member of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, we called for the for the launch. We, we launched a project for the establishment of an independent public complaint institution or committee that will be responsible for investigating complaints against the police, because. For many years now, what we have seen is that the vast majority of complaints which are um, submitted to PIP, the internal agency of the police responsible for investigating complaints against the police, the vast majority of such complaints have gone unresolved. Either they have not been investigated, or even when they have been investigated, they will tell you that the report is an internal matter mm. and they are not compared to this to the public. Yeah. So that is such an unfortunate situation. And we think that as a matter of urgency, it is necessary for us to have an independent public complaint institution that will deal with such matters. But I, I agree with you. It is a very unfortunate situation. And we don't seem to value the lives of citizens, you know. And the majority of these victims are people in the lower echelons of society who don't have a voice, the voiceless. And, you know, the people in authority do not seem to demonstrate concern and compassion for such people, especially when they are victims of extreme brutality by the police. Right. And in such situations, you know, it is necessary for those in authority, authority to take drastic action against the perpetrators, I mean, in the, the police in this case. Mm. Now, um, I, I, I know you were a part of the, the group that uh, drew up uh, the, is it NACAB? Um, yes. 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 Now, um, I don't know whether there was anything in there regarding the police and uh, their current status of investigating themselves, which you've, ex you've, you've uh, quite eloquently explained, doesn't really have much confidence of the people because of how they have not resolved so many of the complaints that have come up against them. Um, in NACAP, was there any prescription for how 
you know, issues of police complaints should be dealt with? Um, NACA covers a very wide range of issues, and um, it applies to almost all institutions of state, but I don't recall that that specific issue of, um, you know, police brutality is, is, is covered, but mm -hmm. it, it, and it, it is definitely covered mm -hmm. in, a, in a broad way in terms of um, institutional renewal, you know, inculcating in the police and other leaders of institutions, the values of um, you know law and order, the values of professionalism, mm. the values of integrity, the values of demonstrating um, respect and regard for the for citizens' uh, rights, and so on. That definitely is covered in the NACAP, mm. and also in the NACAP, you know that there, there is. Uh, a, a lot of room for training, you know, um, of uh, all manner of uh, professionals, you know, in the society. Mm. But I can tell you that when I was at church, we used to have um, workshops for the police. It was one of the initial workshops that we had, one of the target groups that we had in the very beginning, in 1994, 95 was workshops we had for the police to educate them on citizens' rights, to educate them on the human rights contained in Chapter 5 of, of, of the Constitution, mm. to educate them on, you know, uh, issues relating to arrest and treatment of citizens when they're arrested, and, you know, the, 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 the whole question of police brutality you know, mm. um, yeah. so it, it was yeah. something that we did regularly all over the country. Mm. I guess that's a commendable uh, a suggestion I wish Shiraj could return to. Um, uh, but for, for now, we want to say a big thank you to you, um, Justice Emil Short, former commissioner of Shiraj. Um, yeah, interesting suggestion there, yeah, some capacity building. Yeah. 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 I'm sure you're absolutely. familiar with some, oh, and you yeah. have a mind of your own on many of Oh, yeah, yeah, and I think that, I mean, I, I absolutely agree uh, with the training bit. You know, he mentioned the mm. lack of training yeah. to handle <laughs> situations like that, mm. so I think that it looks like we are building consensus yeah. on the need for training. How about that thing about the judges and how in other parts of the mm. world if a, a, a suspect turns up in your court with a swollen eye and all of that mm. and has clearly been beaten by the police, mm. I mean, that's enough grounds to throw out the well, case. Why I don't we do that, that here? Yeah, I think that, I mean, we've had matters uh, where judges have raised issues with how suspects have been handled. Mm. So, um, I mean, to a large extent, I, I, I know that once the person is arraigned before court, a lot of times judges will raise issues. Right. Except for situations where they were um, either robbery suspects which were engaged in like gun battles mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. That one, you would know that mm -hmm. it, it, was, yeah. it was something that was part of the mm -hmm. operation. Yeah. However, um, in situations where normal, ordinary, ordinary civilians mm. uh, have issues with, with the police, the judges have always raised issues mm. with police, you know. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, this has been this has been illuminating. Thank yeah. you so much for coming through, uh, Francis yeah, Xavier Susu, yeah, human right. rights is my lawyer. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Thank and you, uh, no yeah. doubt we'll be talking more about these matters in the coming days. Uh, don't miss as if we weren't human. Um, the hotline documentary put together by Jojo Cobner. Right. Well, don't go too far. We're back with more after these.